All right, all right, peace. ETM Hotep to everyone listening in. Welcome to the Seshu Ma'ani Meru Nature YouTube channel. This is your brother, Wujao Minib Eri Ma'at. And I would like to welcome everyone who's already tuned in, who um, received a notification uh, and has already subscribed. But make sure you subscribe if you haven't and you, you know, happen to stumble across our channel. And make sure you tick the bell so you'll be notified whenever we go live. All right. So I want to have a, a quick discussion, um, actually a quick lesson. And that's the title of this uh, video, a quick lesson, the mechanics of language. And so I want to take a moment and break down the mechanics of, of language. But I'm going to give a little bit of time so the people who may have been notified, they can, uh, you know, get their pens and pads ready to hopefully take some notes all right so i want to say a uh, shout out to everyone in the chat already we see uh phylitis tist <laughs> hotep niwasara hotep sister mika thurman viasa uh brother daryl bow uh bowers don williams um and uh a good brother june send june the seshu is definitely in the house all right, so and we have Rashu Sadiq L. He says, Islam, peace. Peace to you, brother. All right, so I'm going to go through this uh, brief uh, lesson, and I just want you all to make sure you, um, I want to make sure you understand what it is that, I, you know, I'm going to be explaining. And so once I'm done, I will take some questions, brief questions, because I don't want this video to be too long. I want it to be a bite-sized chunk <laughs> that people will watch because when these videos get too long you know it's kind of kind of a put off or turn off for people to actually sit down and watch them if you see a video that's four hours long that's two movies you know and people don't have that much time on their hands to sit through a very long video so i want to keep this as brief as i can without um skipping anything so i'm going to be concise so if you do have any questions i will Try my best to answer them um, in a timely fashion. All right. So share the video um, to anyone who you feel that that will benefit from this conversation. All right. So I'm going to just jump straight into it. All right. So again, for those who just tuned in late, uh, ETM Hotep, which which means welcome and peace. And this is your brother Wujao. And we're about to get dive in the title of this brief lesson is uh, the mechanics of language all right so we just want to jump on in and while i'm talking um i know there's a delay between what i'm saying and, and you all's response but if someone can let me know that i could be heard loud and clear and that my screen could be seen and everything is all green all right so i'm gonna keep moving forward but if someone can do that for me i appreciate it all right so uh, the lesson today is a quick lesson on the mechanics of language. And of course, today is March 23rd, 2020. We are already in the spring. Oh, and also I would like to say, I hope that everyone is uh, doing their due, due diligence. Uh, they're erring on the side of caution. They're being cautious in the midst of the um, coronavirus outbreak. Um, you know, uh, technically it's called SARS-CoV-2. It's a coronavirus related to the SARS uh, coronavirus as well. And the disease uh, COVID-19 or, you know, simply coronavirus. And I hope everyone's being safe and, and cautious enough to stay safe. You know, and I say that whether you believe that the virus was created in a laboratory or nature or whatever the case is, it's really irrelevant to your health. Because I'm sure whichever one you believe you don't want it so you know hopefully everybody's exercising caution and i hope that everyone is uh, healthy and safe out there all right so we're going to dive in so the lesson is um the mechanics of language all right so for those who don't know we have a website the website is on the screen it is seshmedunetcher.com all right that's the home of the seshumani metunetcher website has been up for for quite a long time and on that site, we have um, articles, blogs, transliterations, translations, and information 
And, you know, our goal is, is for it to be like a one stop shop for all things um, ancient Egyptian in terms of language and culture. All right. Well, specifically the language. All right. We want to make it like a Walmart for Egyptian language. All right. So we're going to be become more active or updating the website. But that's the website there uh, where we hold our lessons, our classes, our study sessions and things like that is Sabre University, SabreUniversity.com. That's the website that hosts um, the study courses. So for those who are interested in the beginners course, which is I'm, I'm starting this Sunday, this coming Sunday, I'll be starting the first session with the new group. If you're interested um, in that, please, uh, you know, go to SabreUniversity.com and register. Here's the actual uh, flyer for the new study group. <clears throat> Put that on the screen for for a second. Um, you could take a screenshot of this um, for your own records. And if you know anybody who's also interested, make sure you pass the word. All right. So let's get back here. All right. So we're just going to dive in. So let's get started. So communication. <clears throat> What is communication? Communication is the successful sharing or making concepts common. That's what communication is. All right. Now, the goal of language is to transmit meaning from one person to another or many people. Concepts or meaning must be clothed in a form which is sound or, writ or written or writing in order to be transmitted. And. That should be obvious to us because we're not telepathic creatures. We, we weren't designed by nature to be telepathic. We don't just uh, directly transmit our thoughts to another person. All right. So this is why concepts and meaning must be clothed or given form. All right. And that form is either in a sound pattern or something written. All right. And obviously we do. We also have uh, sign language and things like that. So a language itself is a system of signs. All right. Keep that in mind. So what do we mean by a language is a system of signs? Well, first, we have to make sure we understand what a sign is, because, you know, a sign to many people could be many different things. So what is a sign? A sign is composed of three elements. And this is what you see on the screen. These three circles forming a triangle is what constitutes a sign. So here at the bottom left, we have form. So a form is the signifier. All right. And that form could be either a sound pattern or a written pattern. Then we have on the other side, we have meaning. The meaning is the signified. It's what's signified. And it's the concept or meaning. And a concept is something that is grasped within the mind. And so the word itself concept means to grasp in the mind. And then between these two, we have the link. The, the, the thing that tethers those two, those two things together. So we have the link. So we have these three things and all three constitutes a sign. That's why you see the word sign in the middle. All right. This is what a sign is. All three. Not just two, not just one, but all three constitutes a sign. So going back to communication, when we when we're communicating with one another, what we're actually doing, let's say we have two people, person A and person B. Person A is trying to communicate to person B. So what happens is person A is taking their concepts within their mind those things that are conceived or conceptualized within the mind they're encoding it or giving it form okay and that form could be either something written or it could be a sound pattern that they say out their mouth and what happens is they transmit that form over to person b and then person b receives the form from person a whether it's written or a speech or a sound pattern. <clears throat> and then they have to decode it for its meaning. They have to extract meaning from it. All right. So now that seems easy enough. That's that's pretty straightforward. You have the encoding process 
the transmission, and then the receiving, reception, and then the decoding process. And that is what successful communication is. But how is it successful? What, what prevents it from, what prevents the communication uh, from, from um, messing up, creating miscommunication? All right. So to explain that, I'm going to give you an example of a sign and what I mean by sign. So remember, at all times, a, a language is a system of signs. So when we say English, when we give languages names like English, Spanish, French, German, Italian, Russian, uh, and even African language, tree, Kiswahili, the Luo, uh, Kikongo, um, etc. All right. Those languages, what we're calling uh, those languages by those names, they're systems of signs. OK, keep that in mind. Now, for this example, I'm going to give you an example of an English sign. All right. So we have the same diagram here. So let's start on the con concept side. So here, this is what a person conceives in the mind. Remember, the word concept means to grasp in the mind. All right. So. This particular person or this particular sign uh, consists of this concept here that I'm pointing here on the screen. All right. This concept that's conceived in the mind is given form. Ha also has a form. All right. This form for English for an English sign is when written. It's E L E P H A N T. When spoken. It is elephant. OK. The spoken form is elephant and the written form is E-L-E-P-H-A-N-T. Now, this form and this concept are glued together. They're tethered together, which is this link up here at the top. It's linked together and all three of those constitute a sign. And that's very important to understand. All three constitute a sign. OK, not just the form, not just the concept. They have to be linked together. So all three of those constitute a sign. So this is an example of an English sign. All right. To illustrate further, we're going to go into another system of signs. Remember, a language is a system of signs. So that's English. Let's go to another system of signs. We're going to go to Kiswahili. All right. So here's an example of a Kiswahili sign. So notice that we have the same concept, the same thing that's grasped in the mind. But to Kiswahili speakers, they give it a different form. The form among Kiswahili speakers, if written, is N-D-O-V-U. When spoken, it's Ndovu. Ndovu. All right. Same conceptualization different form than it was in English but both of these and the and the tethering or the gluing of these two together constitutes a sign but this sign is different than the English sign remember a sign is the totality of all three so this English sign is different than the Kiswahili sign all right let's go through another example Here's an example of a Duluo sign. All right. We have the same conceptualization as you see here. It's the same thing. But this is given form. And if it was written, it would be L-I-E-C-H. And the spoken or pronunciation would be Liech. All right. So to Duluo speakers, this conceptualization is given the form Liech. Notice that this sign in its totality is different from the Kiswahili sign, which is different from the English sign. And remember, a language is a system of signs. All right. So now. Something should be very obvious to you with these three examples. So the English. Kiswahili. And the Luo. 
notice that the on the concept side or the meaning side, it stayed the same. The only thing that changed was the form. All right. Again, the meaning side stayed the same. The form side is what changed between the three. So this is what we have. So notice that we have the same conceptualization, what's grasped in the mind, but we have three different forms. We have elephant, ndovu, and liech. Now, when when this occurs, as 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 we can see on the same on the same uh, screen on the, on the same thing on the on the screen, what we can now do because of this, we can now successfully translate between systems of signs or put another way we can now translate between languages remember a language is a system of signs all right so what is translation translation is the communication of meaning of a source language which is text or speech by means of an equivalent target language uh, text or speech so translation, in order to translate, the translator has to have knowledge of two or more languages. Meaning, anybody who is translating, they have to have knowledge of the system of signs for the two or more languages. So in our case, we're dealing with three languages, Duluo, Kiswahili, and English. You have to have knowledge of English signs, Swahili signs, and Duluo signs to, uh, to, to be able to recognize matches on the meaning side. Remember, translation is the communication of meaning. So you have to understand the meaning and then match those meanings and then reveal the different forms. And that's what we've done. So the meaning for all three of these are the same. That's why I have a picture of this elephant here. The meaning is the same, but these are three different forms, and that's what translation is. So Duluo, so Liet, Lietch, Ndovu, and elephant are all equal. I can actually put equal signs in between uh, each of these. Okay, so you see how that works? That's what translations are. They're the matching of the concepts but revealing the different forms between the various different systems of signs called languages. All right. So let's continue. Now we have this thing, this phenomenon in languages all across the world. It's not exclusive to any one language. It's a matter of fact, it exists in pretty much all languages, most languages. I, I'll leave room for the, the, the rare exception. But for the most part, uh, homonyms is a phenomenon in most languages. All right. And homonyms, the word homo means same, not homo as in uh, homosexual. Oh, excuse me. It's, it's the act actual word, the same prefix in the word homosexual. Um, but I don't want, you know, it's not the abbreviation for that. Um, but homonym. And so it consists of homophones and homographs. Now, the difference between these two is homophones are words that sound the same but have different meanings that's where you get the word phones from sound homographs the word graphs means written something that's written so homographs are words that are spelled alike but di um, mean different things okay so and these exist in pretty much all languages around the world so here's an example within the english uh, language or the English system of signs we have homophones so here's an example so we have this concept of the past tense of leave like to exit something all right the past tense of leave is given the form left spelled l-e-f-t and we pronounce it left we also within the English language within the English system of signs we have another concept which is the opposite of right, like the, your right hand or the right side of your body. OK, the opposite of that is given a form left. Spelled L-E-F-T or pronounced left. All right. These are two totally different 
signs. Okay? These are two different signs, but they are spelled alike, which means they look alike and they sound alike. So this is an example of a homonym. All right. So this will cover both their, their homophones and homographs. All right. Both of these. All right. Now, this exists in, like I said, pretty much all languages around the world. All right. So we have to be mindful now because homonymy exists as a as a feature of languages around the world. Then now we should un understand why it's very important to understand signs or what is tethered to the forms when we hear them or when we read them. And many times what helps us out in everyday, you know, speech and everyday um, reading is what's called context. So we have context clues that we'll let, you know, if I if I put this word left inside of a sentence and say, you know, um, I left my house at 10 p.m. Based on the context around the word left, you can tell which which one of these two that I'm referring to. OK, which sign I'm actually using. I left my house at 10 p.m. Saturday. You'll know that I'm that I'm I'm using the first sign and not the second one. All right. So just to make that clear, hopefully that's clear. So now that's a that's how many homonymy within a language within a system of signs. So now I want to show you a an example of homonymy across multiple systems of signs or across multiple languages. In this case, I'm going to show you an example within the du Duluo. All right. So in among Duluo speakers, uh, the conceptualization of sending something like uh, sending a letter to someone is given the form or it's pronounced or the conceptualization of sadness in the minds of Duluo speakers is given the form sin. This is how this is the, the spoken form sin. This is what they say sin. The conceptualization of a mountain, a big mountain or whatever the case is, a mountain is given the form got among Duluo speakers or sin got sin, sadness and mountain. The conceptualization of I have stepped on and broken it or him is given the conceptualization of, excuse me, is given the form and yone mature and yone mature. This is how it is pronounced and spoken among the Luo speakers. Now, what I want you to what I want you to take note of is that if you didn't know that. I'm I'm standing within a system of signs among the Luo speakers and you assumed that I'm standing amongst English speakers. You would take these words or sin got and and yet anyone mature completely different. You would think that this is a conjunction in the English language. You would think that sin meant something bad. You would think that got is is a word for possession like like I have or belonging to like I got a book or I got an A on my report card today, you know, to own or possession. You would never think that as I'm speaking about a mountain. And then this um, on your name, mature, you would look at this and think I'm saying anyone mature. Anyone mature. OK, so. I'm showing you this to emphasize the importance of something that is that is very commonly slept on among everybody. It's not it's not unique to any any group of people, but language, semantics, pragmatics, semiotics. These are these are these are things that I encourage everyone to at least take up, at least get a book, a basic book on those three things. And at your own time, do some studying of it. All right. It's very important in eliminating miscommunication <clears throat> and it's, it, it will work out a lot better in a lot of conversations that people have. It will eliminate um, miscommunication. 
It would eliminate um, conflicts, arguments, and even reduce debates. Okay, so this is an example. Or sin got, and in anyone mature, if we if we were to assume this was English, but you can see how we'd be totally wrong. All right. So I wanted to point that out. Next, we have this uh, phenomenon in language called polysemy. All right. And I'll just read what is polysemy. Polysemy is the association of one word with two or more distinct meanings. And a polyseme is a word or phrase with multiple meanings. The word polysemy comes from the Greek word which means uh, many signs the word poly means many and semi is sign okay and this is where you get the word semiotics semiotic is a is a study is an actual study of signs all right that's where you get the word semi <coughs> so the ad adjectival or adjective forms of these words include polysemous and polysemic all right now, in contrast to polysemy is a one to one match between a word and a meaning, which is called monosemy. All right. Mono meaning one. One sign. Monosemy. In the handbook of linguistics uh, by William Croft, he notes mono, mono and quote monosemy is probably most clearly found in specialized vocabulary dealing with technical topics. So what does that mean? This is why this very statement is why in every single um, serious field of study, such as astrophysics, chemistry, evolutionary biology, biology in general, linguistics, mathematics, psychology, law, you know, legal stuff and everything like that. This is why all of those different fields create what's called a nomenclature. They create a, a, a set of terms and it's defined monosemic, meaning that that these terms are given a definition and those definitions stay static within that field of study. And this what what that does is it reduces ambiguity. So polysemy is the root of ambiguousness, ambiguity. So to reduce ambiguity, therefore reducing miscommunication what people do within fields of study, they create a monosemic environment of words. OK, they create and define words that's going to govern the conversation. So this is what has to happen in, in communication. Whenever you're dealing with highly polysemic words, you have to define the terms. You have to define terms at the beginning of a conversation, at the beginning of a lecture, at the beginning of of an argument at the beginning of communication period all right that's a must okay so according to continue according to some estimates more than 40 percent of english words have more than one meaning and that's big 40 percent of the english language is polysemic you understand what that means that means that means there's a 40 percent chance of the average conversation being ambiguous has the potential to be ambiguous and that ambiguity is the is the is the environment for miscommunication and miscommunication is the environment for arguments and if and if arguments get too serious it's the it's the building blocks of of uh of conflict whether it's physical or verbal that's what fights come out. Most, most fights, <laughs> domestic abuse is because of miscommunication, even on a level of, of nations. Nations go to war over miscommunication after diplomacy fails. That's when, you know, wars happen. All right. So to continue, the fact that so many words or lexemes are polysemous shows that semantic changes often add meanings to the language without subtracting any. All right. So I just want to make this all clear. Hopefully everyone is following everything I'm saying so far. All right. And like I said, I'm going to take a few questions after I'm done. And if you just jumped on, make sure you rewind because I don't want to make this too, too long. But make sure you rewind the video and and um, catch up. And then, you know, if you want to contact me to have questions afterwards, 
then um, that's perfectly fine. All right. But let's continue. So now I, w I just want to do a, a quick review before I continue. And that, that'll help anybody who just who just came in. Remember, communication is the transmission of concepts from one person to another or to many other people. OK. And to do that, we use language. And so what is language? Language is a system of signs. All right. So what is a sign? Remember, a sign consists of three elements, three things. It's composed of three things, form, meaning and the link between the two form, meaning and the link between the two. All three of these constitute a sign. All right. The form could be a sound pattern or written pattern. The concept is what is grasped in the mind. And those have to be glued together or tethered together, which is the link. And all three of those, again, is a sign. All right. And in order to successfully communicate. Now, here's the thing that I didn't explain uh, before. When we when we communicate, as I'm talking to you all right now, the reason why you all can understand me is because we share the same system of signs in our mind. Your, you have you have a mental lexicon in your mind of signs. I have a mental lexicon of signs in my mind. We those signs in my mind and the signs in your mind are shared. They're the same. That's the only reason why you can hear what I'm saying to you right now and you understanding me right now. All right. And so when we talk to one another, the default assumption is that you have the same signs in your head as I do in mine. OK, the moment that you don't have the same signs in your head, that's when I can't communicate to you. And therefore, we 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 say it as if you do not understand my language. All right. That's a natural assumption. When I open my mouth to talk to you all, I'm assuming that you all have the same signs in your head. But as I just discussed, as I just showed, as far as English is concerned and many languages, we have a phenomenon called polysemy, which in English, 40 percent of the of the words in English are polysemic. So although I assume that you have the same signs in your head as I do mine, I still have to make sure that you're choosing the correct signs as I'm trying to communicate my thoughts to to you. And this is where we have to define terms, especially the highly polysemic terms. All right, because we're not going to sit there in a normal conversation where. You know, I'm trying to talk to someone and I'm saying, well, hey, I have to define every single word in the sentence that I'm that's coming out of my mouth, you know, coming out of my mouth. You know, I have to define each one of those. So, no, um, it doesn't mean that we have to do that, but we have to pay attention to the highly polysemic words that causes confusion, causes ambiguity. All right. So to move on, I'm going to give an example of such a word all right god bam there we go <laughs> so this word right here man let me let me make it really big this is this has to this has to be in the top 10 polysemic or disruptive polysemic words of all times the word god okay now, what I have on my screen is a, a dictionary entry for this word coming from the online Merriam-Webster's uh, dictionary. OK, they have four entries, number one through four. <clears throat> and so I'm showing you all four of them. So let's just read them real quick. The first entry, God, the supreme or ultimate reality. God, number two, God, a being or object. That is worshipped as having more than natural attributes and powers. Supernatural. Three, God, a person or thing <clears throat> of supreme value. Fourth, God, a powerful ruler. All right. This is an example of polysemy because each of those four, although they're listed all under the same word in dictionary, they're, they're, these meanings are distinct. These meanings are distinct because a powerful ruler does not have to be supernatural. A person or a thing 
that is of extreme value or supreme value does not have to be supernatural. And a powerful ruler does not necessarily have to be the ultimate reality. You understand? So this, even though our dictionaries list this all under the same word, it's a polysemic. Okay? It's polysemic. And we have to understand that. And this just happens to be one of those polysemic words that causes a lot of arguments, a lot of confusion. Okay? So, with everything that I just said, um, this brings up a point. And because, you know, we, I deal with uh, the ancient Egyptian language known as Rani Kemet and the writing system known as Sesh Medunetcher, and we're on the Seshu Mani Better Nature channel. I'm going to go to Rodney Kimmett for my next example. All right. So here's the question. In ancient Egypt, the ancient Egyptian language is called Rodney Kimmett, by the way. So if you all are new, if that term is new to you, that's what I'm referring to. Rodney Kimmett, the ancient Egyptian language. Now, in the language we see this written form that you see here, these glyphs that you see here, and then underneath is a transliteration. And we pronounce this transliteration netcher, netcher. Some people pronounce it netter, like N-E-T-E-R, netter. But most of us pronounce it netcher. That underlying T has a C-H sound, like church, netcher, all right? And so here's the question. When you're reading translations, so remember what I said about translations, okay? What is translations? Well, what does it mean to translate? To translate means to uh, communicate meaning from a source language to a target language. And to do that, you have to match concepts. Like I said here, this concept is a, a exact match for these three different forms in three different languages. Elephant, Ndovu, Liech. So back to this one. So here's the question. When early Egyptologists and, and uh, translators, when they were reading the Egyptian text and they came across this form on the form side, what did they tether it to? What was the concept in their minds when they translated it? <clears throat> so, we all know that they translated this as far as form is concerned in English as God. So when you look up in any English, uh, English Egyptian dictionary, you'll find the word nature translated as God. All right. So walk with me, y'all. Nature is translated as God. But I just showed you that God is polysemic. So just by, by today's standards, these, they had four options. If they're going to use this form, which they did, God, G-O-D, which of these four distinct conceptualizations did they go with in their translation? When they translated nature as God, did they mean a powerful ruler? Did they mean a personal thing of supreme value? Did they mean something that's supernatural? Or did they mean the supreme or ultimate reality? That's the question. And are they correct? Okay. Now, to the ancient Egyptians, because this is, this is what the translators should have been the goal, their goal. What they're trying to do is they're trying to understand what the Egyptians conceived when they wrote this word. When they when they carved this word in stone or papyri, papyri, what were the Egyptians conceiving in their mind? Were they conceiving something supernatural? Were they conceiving a ruler? Were they conceiving the ultimate reality, or were they conceiving something of extreme importance? You understand? So that's very very important, and we can't make a blanket assumption. So when you have people that come along and they're reading English translations of Egyptian text and they're seeing the word God 
it would be an error for someone to superimpose their already uh, preconceived or biased conceptualization of God on to the ancient Egyptians. So, for example, if I am a Christian, then my conceptualization of God is going to be through the lens of Christianity. And most likely my concept of God is going to is going to be informed from the Bible. Now, that is my concept of God as a Christian. So when I read Egyptian texts and I see the word God, am I correct in superimposing my concept of God onto the ancient Egyptians? No, I will be I will be wrong. That would be a wrong assumption and a wrong thing to do. And so this is what's going on in 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 um, in a lot of arguments and a lot of circles where people are arguing over th the conceptualizations of God in different cultures. They're superimposing. Their idea of God onto other people and not allowing the people themselves to have their own agency. And allow them to define or reveal the conceptualization that they have in mind. And this is what's happening. All right. Same thing with the word theos. This is a Greek sign. Theos. What were the Greeks conceptualizing when they gave it a form pronounced theos or theos? What? What were they conceiving? Were they conceiving Jesus Christ? Were they conceive were they conceiving Yahweh? What's what's described as Yahweh? Elohim and all this and that. So these are things, these are these are things that have to be uh hashed out um and teased out in order to have any productive conversation. In other words, in order to have a successful communication. Let me go back. In order to have a successful communication between two people, you have to understand what's being conceived in the mind of both people. It has to match. And so it's very, very important in all of these discussions, especially when it comes to polysemic um, words, because those words produce ambiguity. Ambiguity is the enemy of successful communication. I'm going to repeat that. Ambiguity is the enemy, the arch enemy, arch enemy of successful communication. Okay? So remember that. And so that I'm going to end there. Um, I'm going to put this back on the screen because I want to reiterate that question to everyone. But this question should 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 also is fitting for all cultures around the world okay i'm only showing writing kemet or ancient egyptian for this example but this same question can be asked for any culture around the world where where certain concepts among the people of that culture are being translated in english as god okay so Remember, because all gods are not made the same. The very word God in English is not the same. It's polysemic. OK. And so this all of this creates an ambigu uh, ambiguous atmosphere. And then people jump in the ocean of ambiguity and then try to argue. And they don't know how to swim. And so people end up drowning in ambiguity. And so what I'm doing is I'm functioning as a lifeguard and I'm trying to throw a, a life raft to people by doing this presentation, this quick presentation to let people know, hey, relax in that water. Slow down, breathe, kick your legs a little bit, throw your arms over. You can relax, hold your breath. You fill your lungs with air, your body will have a lot more buoyancy. Come swim over here. Grab the pole. Let me lure you over here to the side and bring you out of this water. That's what I'm doing right now. 
with this brief presentation, okay? Because we got a lot of people who jumped out of the window holding bricks without a parachute and smack dab right in the ocean of ambiguity. And a lot of people are talking and don't know that they got water in their mouth and they're choking. All right. So that's the purpose of me doing this today. And I'm going to do more of these uh, to keep the conversation going, to break down and explain things, um, you know, to my best ability, um, you know, to make to clarify and edify. All right. So I'm going to end here. And like I said, I'll briefly take any questions. So I, I'm, I'm going to pay attention to the chat. So if you have any questions right now, um, go ahead and type them in and I'll do my best to answer them. And I'll just take a few because, like I said, I don't want this video to be too long. All right. So hopefully you have some takeaways. Hopefully I, I was I was clear. And if I'm not clear, by all means, go ahead and ask your questions. All right. Let me um, put this up here on the screen so you all can see. it. All right. So. Or let me know that you understood. So listen, if you if if this was plain, if if you know, if this was understandable and you and you think that that um, I made the point and you know I got the point across and it was clear, let me know. Hit one, hit hit one, type one, if you um, if this is clear to you. Otherwise, you know, go ahead and ask your um, questions, and I'll see if anybody has any and everything all right so let's just see but so so for those who who are just tuned in though i want to i want to um say i appreciate you tuning in um you know peace out shout out to everybody in the in the chat i see i see some conversations going on uh so peace to the sister amber mika uh five lightest i already said marquise kid lb uh, who else that I didn't shout out? Asar Man, Man TV, Sonnet Emiket, Thurman Meredith, uh, Ampianki, Hotep, Zane, Brother Zane. So yeah, if you have any questions, I'm gonna stick around for a couple of minutes. Cause like I said, how long we have? Uh, 50 minutes. All right, 10 minutes. I'm gonna keep this to an hour. So I got 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes. 10 minutes max. I gotta be disciplined. <laughs> 10 minutes 10 minutes max all right so uh donnie c rashu don williams peace uh zane uh let me see zane i think you had a q you put q you have a question you know i'm just trying to make it plain plain all right because a lot of conversations i've seen i've witnessed i've been doing this for years all right I've, I, you know, I've, I've, I've been in many circles. I've engaged many circles, many ideologies, many different um, uh, trains of thoughts and things like that. And you know, I see patterns, I see issues and problems, and I'm, you know, doing my best to try to eliminate problems because a lot of things are completely unnecessary. I'm telling you, unnecessary. A lot of arguments I see online, um, you know, I, it's it's a waste. In many respects. All right. So. Uh, Niwasara, you say you're listening with your eight and five year old. Let me ask you, as far as your eight year old, if, if they're listening, did they understand? Because if an eight and five year old can understand what I'm saying, then then this is platinum. This is gold. Because that's the point. You know. I'm trying to make it plain now. Now, here, now, now, here's the thing. What I'm explaining or what I've explained is something that is overlooked and taken for granted in everyday life. The reason why is because we grow up speaking a language at a, from a very young age. And of course, we go to school to get formal training in, in our mother language like English. If you grow up speaking English, you're going to speak English and understand English before you actually take anything formal about it. Because you're going to learn your language from home, your parents your siblings, you know, your family. And so when we go to school, we're just given the formalization of grammar, syntax, you know, and literature. But then after that, we feel like we're good. So we don't need to, to go into any further study with it because we use it every day, you know? And so, and so a lot of, 
peculiar or de detailed things about language is never looked at or studied by the average person. And that's unfortunate. So linguistics and all of its many subfields is probably one of the top most slept on fields of study among people. And I'm going to tell you this language is mathematics. So if you're not good in math, then the details of language is going to is going to be a little problematic for you. OK. And so it's, it's so that's a challenge for us who teach you know, various different things uh, within linguistics. Um, that's a challenge we have because, you know, it's it's mathematics and and we have to be able to explain things to people who may not have an affinity towards math. You know, like like, you know, I grew up. I grew up math and science was man, that was my two favorite subjects. I aced it all my whole school career from K through 12 college, everything. OK, and. Uh, computer programming, you, you actually see it applied right there in computer programming and many other areas, but, but I actually see it manifest right there. And um, a lot of my friends around me, though, you know, people that I grew up with, they hated math. I helped them out, <laughs> you know, and things like that. And that's just unfortunate. But all right, let me get to these questions. So Zane says, uh, question, homonyms, where does this play in? in this okay and he says like mine possessive possessive and mine place does the word god have the same function okay so first of all uh mine as in the possessive and mine as in the place where where um precious jewels are found precious stones you know like mine a mine um th uh, that's a good example of a homonym because we have uh, words that have distinct meanings, but they are pronounced alike, sound alike, and look alike. And so you're asking me, does the word God have the same function? Um, yeah, because what happens is polysemic, polysemic words are borderline homonyms. It's just that people don't elevate it or call it a, a homonym. So... For example, uh, what's a good example? What happens in in at least in in um, ancient languages before the onset of writing? OK. What people had to do, remember, before the world was was exposed to writing, every human being within a community or a culture had to memorize the the cultural meanings of all the words that came out of their mouth and they had to do it without the help of a dictionary or writing period so what happens is because languages grow because every every culture has um is organic and it expands it, it's living and thriving when they want to coin new words which is called a neo a neologism when they want to coin a new word they used to look for logical associations, logical connections between words, but either the way they sound or what things were called. So a lot of words will sound alike, but be referring to this two distinct or two or more distinct different things. OK, and so that still happens today because that's that's just the nature of language and language evolution, language change. And so God being polysemic is is one of those words. But because of society and culture, it will it will get to the point of, of such a, um, ambiguity that people will treat it all of it as if it's the same. And that and that creates the problem. And God is one of those words. All right. The moment you say God, people assume that you're talking about some uh, omnipresent, omnipotent and an omniscient being in the sky in a place called heaven that created the world in six days rested on the seventh and then he interferes with his creation every now and then and things like that that's the dominant 
conceptualization uh, among the community of Americans, United States citizens and the United States of America. All right. Uh, Amber, I don't think there's any confusion of what you're trying to relate more so an unwillingness to adapt. That's true. Um, everything is everything. Did you just say mother language is English? No, what I'm saying is that I use English as an example. Whatever your mother language is by mother language, I'm talking about your birth language, the language that you are taught first as a child. Not mother of all languages. <laughs> so so I don't want to get that twisted. In no way, shape, or form am I saying the mother of all languages is English. I'm saying for many of us, our mother language, meaning the language we were taught at birth, is English. All right, let's see. Anything else? All right, I'm just now noticing the super chat. Uh, by the way, the super chat is, you know, is activated, and I I want to show appreciation for um, brother Don Williams for the donation. And earlier, um, Yvonne, uh, the donation greatly appreciated, and 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 we say that in Ronnie Kemet is dua dua u, which means um, dua means to to gratitude or to give thanks, and dua u is the plural form of that as if we're saying many thanks so greatly appreciate that do i do i for that um and let's see a couple more uh what else what else what else everything is everything so based on what wajao just said even christians hebrews and muslims are atheists i don't know how you uh got that impression so but you know based on anything i said christians hebrews and muslims are not atheists so you have to uh clarify that a bit uh everything is everything uh let's see neologic yeah neologism <laughs> Neo <laughs> you i think this is uh brother zane yeah that's the correct spelling neologism all right. Neologism to break down the word neologism. You have neo is new and logism from the word logos word. Logos, logo, logo, logos is word and neo is new. So neologism is simply a fancy way of saying the coining of new words. And it's done differently. It's, it's different ways in which people coin new words. And all of those ways are summed up under the umbrella term neologisms. All right. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Anything else? I guess not. So I'm going to wait on everything is everything and see if you can clarify what your, you know, your last statement. And um, we're at 61 minutes. So I want to I want to go ahead and wrap it up. But I'm going to wait for that last question. So um, everything is everything. Waiting on you. Waiting on you. Waiting on you. Hotep T'Challa. African gods are not conformed to the need for beliefs. It is a matter of understanding that their uh, their worldview and what they mean by God. Well, listen. On that note, while I'm waiting for everything is if he's going to type. Um, Africans don't use the word God. So let's let's make it very, very clear. OK, Africans do not use the form G.O.D. And and if 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 people understood and, and take away what my point is for, for this quick lesson, you'll understand the importance of why I'm even doing what I'm doing. It's it's the fact that you're you're translating which is you're bringing a concept from from a source language and bringing it over into a target language. And so for English speakers, if you're going to compare African uh, conceptualizations and then bring those over into English, what people are doing is that they're bringing those concepts over into English and in the, under the form G.O.D. God. But English already has a preconceived conceptualization of what G.O.D. or God is. And so the error that a lot of people are making is that they're superimposing 
that concept over onto these African cultures. And that is the biggest error that people can make. And that's why there's a lot of confusion. And this is why I say both atheists and theists are equally confused. You have a bunch of new age atheists running around now that are propping themselves up as more, being more learned than the theists and, and pejoratively calling theists, you know, um, spooky, ridiculous and, and this and that. But all the while, these new age atheists are just as confused as the theists. All right. And so, well, like I said, I'm the lifeguard in this situation. I'm trying to throw the lifeline. I'm trying to tell people, hey, relax, take a deep breath. Let your body be buoyant. Float in that water of ambiguity. Come over to the side. Everything's be all right. All right. Because these new age atheists and theists are drowning. They're choking. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Um. T'Challa, I'm very aware, but because we speak English, that's the word I have to use. Oh, no, no, I, I get it. That's the uh, T'Challa. I'm not sure if you tuned in from the beginning, but that's the whole point of <laughs> well, that's one of the main points of me doing the show. All right. And actually, we don't have to use um, English, so don't don't limit it like that. But I, I get you what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. And, and lastly, let me end with this. <clears throat> I was asked today um, the question, if I could name a God that is not a supernatural agent. Because remember, an atheist, it holds the position that they don't believe in God or gods. That's not good enough for a definition. Why? Because God or gods have, has to also be defined. And so summarily, what an atheist is saying when they take that position is that they disbelieve in supernatural agents. And so not all gods of all people around the world are supernatural agents. And so I was asked for for an example of a god that's not a supernatural agent i gave the person one and when i gave them a uh, one they had no idea of who or what that god was and so that alone demonstrated that when you hear atheists say that i disbelieve in all gods i don't believe none of them none of that now we know that that's a relative statement. That's a relative statement to the conceptualization that they have of God. And that's the difference. That's the big difference. So I want y'all to think about that. All right. I want y'all to understand that. That's a relative statement. And, 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 to, and to put the, the um, period on it and the icing on the cake is um, I'm going to give you an example. If I say right now, um, all of you, all of you, I want to say peace to all of you. Okay? That statement, I want to say peace and send my greetings to all of you. Now, let's take all of you. All of you, we know what all means. All uh, connotes or denotes exclude uh, uh, inclusion right it's a word that denotes inclusion all if I say all of you am I talking about every single human being on the planet or is it relative within the context that I'm speaking in and this and this situation all of you meaning all of you only you who are in the chat so when an atheist say that they disbelieve in all gods, they cannot be talking about all gods in an objective universal sense. They can only be talking about all gods within the confines of supernatural agents. OK, I want you all to understand that. Only. All gods can only be a relative statement. 
It doesn't mean all gods, just like I don't mean all human beings when I say peace unto you all. Or all of you. Well, I say all of you, make sure you tune in to the next show. I don't mean every single human being. I mean, all of you who are here now. OK, so everything that I'm, I'm, I'm saying, listen, I would I, I keep encouraging people pick up a book on semantics. Go to Amazon, go to Amazon.com, get a book on a beginner's book on semantics, get a beginner's book on pragmatics and get a beginner's book on semiotics, semiotics, semantics, pragmatics. Teach yourself, become an autodidact. You don't have to take a course. I'm not saying you got to become a, a degree person and this, that, and the third, but get some of the basic uh, uh, understanding of these things. Okay. This is what I've been encouraging for years. And I need for people to do that so that they can understand and spread the word and, and edify and, and, and teach other people. Okay. So we got to have this understanding. So like I said, I, I don't want this to be dra uh, dragged out too long, but we will, you know, I will um, do more of these. And as a whole uh, collective, Seshumani Nature uh, crew, we will um, be coming together and doing more of um, more like presentations like this. All right. So I'm going to sign off. And again, I really appreciate everybody tune, tuning in and um who knows, might might go live again late, a little later on. So keep your ears out open, your eyes open, your ears. Your ears are always open, but, you know, <laughs> uh, make sure you, you subscribe, spread the word, uh, repost this video to those who you think are interested or can benefit from this conversation. And I hope that you all learn something and you can always contact me. I'm not hard to find. I'm the only person with, with the name Wujau. I'm on Facebook. Uh, my email is, is wujau at gmail.com. Um, and lastly, and remember, if, you, if you're interested in taking a course, I'm about to start a whole new um, a group. I, I've organized a group, but we're going to start Sunday. Sunday's going to be our first session, orientation and meet and greet. All right. And I have a, um, a beginner's group that are finishing up. Hopefully those who are in the, in the chat, like Julanda and Mika, Y'all could uh, finish up your final exam. I got I got uh, Mika's final exam today. I'm going to check it out and uh, see how uh, how that goes. And we will um, we'll continue the conversation. All right. So I'm going to say peace to everybody and make sure y'all stay uh, safe out here, um, you know, among the outbreak. All right. Peace.